Welcome to Community Networking and Learning, held on the first and third Thursday of every month from 8.30 to 10 a.m. Today's feature speaker is Cindy Bird, success partner and owner of Image Potential. She will be speaking on the three key attributes of mindful communicators. Nice to see everybody. Welcome to April. It's the first Thursday <laughs> in April our community networking and learning. We are back. We've had a couple of field trips the last couple of times. So we are back in our I've Decided community room, the garden where dreams grow. I love that. And uh, so I'm really excited to have Cindy Bird as our presenter today. And I don't have to sit here and gush over how awesome she is because most of you know um, and she is one of our amazing success partners, but she also owns Image Potential and she's been a, a, a higher education uh, teacher uh, for many, many, many years. And uh, she's founded Image Potential as a coach and leadership trainer. And last year she became a success partner with I've Decided. So lots of stuff going on and she has a lot of good information in her little noggin to share with us. <laughs> and we are very, very blessed uh, to have her as a part of our community. So Cindy, I cannot thank you enough for being a part of our community and for being willing to be here today. This truly is a blessing and a gift that she's uh, giving to us as members of I've Decided. Companies pay big bucks to have her come speak. At they their, do? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they do. They do. <laughs> um, they should pay more, but they do pay for her to come uh, speak uh, to their employees. So this really is a, a generous benefit that she's giving us. So our weekly winning word this week is attributes. Love that word. And we had a great conversation about that over our mastermind um, on Tuesday, our member only mastermind. So that was really cool. But um, you know, we continue to think about our attributes. What are you showing up with every day? What are you bringing to the table, right? What's the good, the bad, and the ugly? What do we, <laughs> what do we need to work on? What do we know that we're good at? And um, obviously, uh, Cindy is an expert in communication, um, and she's done our Master Your Message program. And so today, she's going to share with us the three attributes of a mindful communicator which I think is so important. Uh, what's that saying? Think before you speak. <laughs> yeah, I, you I might hear to, me say that this morning. <laughs> I need to practice that a lot of times, I know. So I'm excited to hear this and I know you will be too. And we are, um, uh, again, just thanks Cindy and I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Thank you. And Kim's got a, uh, I have a handout oh, yeah. that Kim's going to distribute to all of you. So good morning. good morning. Great to see all of you here today. Thank you for choosing to be here. Uh, I want to start with, you know, a little better understanding of why do I do what I do? Why, why is this topic especially near and dear to my heart? It's because I have a passion for quality of life. I know that sounds kind of broad and cheesy, maybe to some people, but I really sincerely believe that there's a lot of unnecessary stress and strife out there between people in their interpersonal relationships that just doesn't have to be that way. And, and especially if we pay more attention to what you're going to hear me talk about this morning with the three key attributes of a mindful communicator. So I do need a couple of volunteers to come up. I promise it's painless. Okay. Adam's volunteering and Julie, I saw your hand go up. So um, this is between, so we just need to change the names. Adam, you're going to be Kurt instead of Kate. <laughs> And Julie, you can still be uh, Emily. So just take a glance over your script and I'll bring you in so everybody can see you. But I'm going to give everyone the background on this first. What do I want you to pay attention to is, you know, what do you notice about this conversation? OK, so I'll give you the background during a staff meeting. Kurt was in the middle of his presentation when Emily, one of his coworkers, interrupted and disagreed with what he was saying. As a result, Kurt lost his concentration and confidence and found it difficult to regroup and get focused again. Kurt became upset and angry, especially since Emily had also interrupted him in a previous meeting. Kurt's been stewing about it since the meeting, so when he saw Emily in the hallway, he blurted out. You want to come over here so you can be in there. Okay. Just stand closer to the microphone. There you go. Take it away. 
You know, you always wait, interrupt wait me. Wait a minute. Oh, Kate is, oh, Kurt. I'm okay, Emily. Time out. Shoot. Okay, take two. Kurt. Kurt, take two. You know, you always interrupt me during my presentations. Yesterday, you did it again. You jumped in before I finished and started disagreeing with me. It really bugs me every time you do that. I don't always interrupt you. And maybe if you said something that made sense, I wouldn't need to disagree with you. <laughs> well, next time, keep your thoughts to yourself until I'm done talking, okay? Well, who do you think you are? I have a right to my opinion. And if you're talking nonsense, I'm going to speak up. Get all right first of all give, yeah give them a round of applause i'll take those off your hands wow yeah, no. <laughs> so what what should you have noticed about that conversation what did you notice attitude attitude molly um, well he was uh, had just was justified in his feeling upset the way he presented it it didn't leave any openings for resolution. Yeah, exactly. It, it was without tact. The, the voices got louder. So how they said it, the word choices, the fact that it was blurted out with no thought beforehand, no thought for tact and diplomacy. Absolutely. Well, they sent some interesting messages because of that, right? Which we're open for interpretation between the two of them, but all of you perhaps drew some interpretation of the messages they were sending as well. It's big things, right? Like, well, you don't have any respect for me. You know, imagine all the things that you're concocting in your mind because everything about you, everything you do sends a message. If you remember only one thing from this morning, it's this concept and the key to thinking about this is that each time someone interacts with you, no matter how or the, the medium or the situation, it's an experience. It's an experience that you're creating for that other person. Mm -hmm. And that experience can end up being either positive or negative based on how they interpret it. And if it's a negative experience, they're going to think negative thoughts about you, mm -hmm. which turn into perhaps negative responses or negative actions, or they're not going to follow you, promote you, hire you, listen to your ideas. And that affects your results. You don't get the outcome that you're seeking. And that in turn affects how you move forward. It's going to affect your demeanor potentially, and then you're going to show up potentially negative again the next time. So we strive for the positive cycle instead, a positive experience through the way we're showing up in our communication that's the better outcome that we seek. We all have some common communication goals. Increase understanding, de decrease misinterpretation, avoid or minimize conflict. I like the first two. I hope nobody walks into a situation and goes, gee, I hope I'm really understood or misunderstood or misinterpreted today. No, we don't want that to happen. And of course we do wanna minimize conflict and we want to achieve some kind of results why we're communicating and interacting with someone and hopefully build positive relationships. Why is there all this white space over here? Do you wonder? You're going, oh, Cindy just forgot to put something there. No, it's there because it represents opportunity. We have so many opportunities to work on achieving these common communication goals. And in my opinion, we have the best opportunity if we focus on being a mindful communicator. And it's these three things we're going to talk about today, presence, awareness, and thoughtfulness. And the X in the middle is the strong point. It's where all three of those attributes come together and represent the best opportunity for you to achieve those communication goals and others. You know, those, that's not a be all end all list of communication goals. Those are the more common ones that we share. So let's get started and talk about presence. Are you really even showing up for that interaction? Again, wherever, whenever, whatever method it might be. Oftentimes we think we're there, we're physically there, but our mind is not there. So what does it mean to have presence? It means that you're actually focused, you're in the moment, you're not in the past, you're not thinking about the next hour, the next 
two years, whatever, you're in the moment, you're giving your full attention to whatever is in front of you at that moment in time. It means that you're showing up in an authentic, calm, composed, confident manner, not arrogant, but calm and composed and confident. And it means also that you're giving of your attention for the sake of someone else. That's key. So your body's present is your mind. We'll talk about what distracts us then. Well, <laughs> what prevents us from being present? Multitasking, okay? Multitasking, some people wear it as a badge of honor. I can multitask. Well, let me tell you what the true definition is of multitasking. It's paying conscious, partial attention to something. Would you brag about that to someone? I am really great at paying partial, conscious attention. Well, I hope not. I hope that you would instead say, no, I can be focused on what's in front of me at the moment. I am not gonna try to switch between things. That's our brain can do it. Sometimes we can do it and we fool ourselves, but if we really wanna be a mindful communicator and have presence and be present with someone truly, we need to not try to multitask in everything that we do. Well, sometimes it's just you know, this multitude of thoughts that are distracting us. And we're human. Our brain is wired to be constantly scanning for what's going on around us. So we might be thinking a lot of these things that, that constitute worry, fear, regret, and the list goes on and on. Those are distractions. Just recognizing that that's a distraction and bring yourself back to the present, to the moment is what's happening here because your mind can drift. Um, our own ego and our own agenda can get in the way too. If you've ever seen the movie, The Devil Wears Prada, <laughs> one of my favorites, but you know, here's Emily uh, um, with um, Andy, right? Yeah. And Emily's main agenda was, I want to look good. I don't care about you. Everything you do is about me looking good. But John Kabat-Zinn, who's one of the fathers of mindfulness and mindfulness meditation, he said this, if we're caught up in the preoccupations of our own mind, in that moment, we cannot be present. We will bring an agenda of some kind to everything we say or do or think, even if we don't know we are. That's really the important part there. So how can you be more present? Know what tends to distract you and then work on those things. We all have our own tendencies of what distract us. It could just be a lot of clutter. It could be physical clutter around you in your office. It could be clutter in your mind. It could be clutter in your heart. Those things can distract us and get in the way of us really being present with someone in the moment. It could be technology. We all carry those wonderful little gadgets with us everywhere we go. And it can be easy to let that phone be a distraction when we should be paying attention. You know, we've all seen it where we go to the restaurant and we go somewhere and there's a group of people and nobody's talking to each other. They're all like this with their nose and their phone. And it happens to all of us from time to time. So just knowing, you know, what are your distractions? One of the key things that we can all work on to be more present is to be a more mindful listener. This is the uh, symbol or mindful listening. It has five elements. This is what's really cool about it. Eyes to see, of course, but that's because you should be observing the other person, observing their body language, observing how they're reacting, responding to you. Undivided attention. We just talked about that to focus your heart to feel, to show empathy and to withhold judgment when you're interacting with someone your mind to think. So clearing your own head and really focusing on what is this person saying to me and hearing them correctly. And of course you need your ears to hear. So reducing literally the noise, but all of those components are important. And you may have heard the term active listening before, but this is really up several notches. This is generous listening. I love the way that that, that word sends a different feeling to us. When we're so generous when, with listening, we are really giving someone our undivided attention. And the third thing you can do to increase your presence is to strengthen your ability to be in the moment. Uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, who is, was a Buddhist monk, he sadly passed away at the age, I think of 96, just recently. 
um, considered one of the fathers of mindfulness and, and mindfulness meditation, has written many, many books on the subject, but this is one of my favorite quotes of his. Anything can be the object of your mindfulness. Anything, including your communication. So what does this mean? It means you can do things to strengthen your ability to be in the moment. How many of you have ever practiced mindfulness meditation? Okay, great. And if you do it consistently, you know what, what the intention is to focus on the breath. Well, you can increase your presence and focus on your breath with a very simple exercise. This comes from Amy Cuddy. She's a Harvard social uh, psychologist and uh, it's the four, seven, eight method. So I'm gonna teach it to you right now and we'll practice it together. So it's inhale for four seconds, hold for seven, exhale for eight. Try it again, four, hold for seven, exhale for eight. You can do that anywhere. The focus is on the breath. But I also want you to practice focusing on something else that's right in front of you. You should have some peeps on your table. And I didn't, I didn't make a sign that said, don't eat the peeps. But because, you know, if you're a fan of peeps, you might want, you know, peeps, we have to find something else to do with peeps, right? Because they're really not very good for us. And I know the microwave thing that people do. Yesterday, I was at our local library dropping off some books for their sale. And and the, there was um, a display where children had done some dioramas with peeps. They were really cute. But today you're gonna, everybody needs a peep and a napkin because they're kind of sticky on the sides where I tore them apart. So everybody needs a peep. So here's what I want you to do once you get your peep in hand. I want you to really focus on how does it look? What do you notice about it? Focus on how does it look? How does it feel in your fingers or in your hand or touching it? How does it feel? How does it smell? And if you're so inclined, you could also taste it, but I would never force anyone to do that. So I usually do this exercise with a raisin, but I thought, oh, peeps are way more fun today with, with Easter coming up. And, uh, you know, again, we have to do something with these peeps. The point is anything can be the object of your mindfulness. The key is to practice on, on anything. It can be just sitting quietly in a room and noticing what sounds do you hear? What things do you see that you never really saw before, or you see them in a different way? Those are all the things that can help you to increase your ability to be present with someone, okay? Uh, let's move on to the second attribute, which is awareness. How aware are you? Do you notice how you're showing up and how people are responding to you? So what does it mean to practice awareness? Well, noticing. Okay, you might miss the whales right beside the boat if you're not really noticing. Now, what does that mean in life? There are a lot of subtle things that perhaps we should be noticing about ourselves and about other people as well. Uh, we need to have a way to deepen. Yeah, here's our, our dear Betty White. Rest her soul. Um, you know, have, have a Snickers. You're not yourself when you're when you're hungry. Uh, hangry, I should say. Yes, I beg your pardon. Hangry. Well, deeper insight about your tendencies is what we're talking about here with awareness. So that self-awareness is so key, but that brings you the opportunity to then be more mindful of how those tendencies are influencing the way you show up in the world. And if you know something about yourself that's perhaps not a very positive tendency or helpful tendency, you can train yourself then to be in the moment and to modify your behavior in the moment because you've learned that about yourself. So what should you notice? You should notice your nonverbal habits. These are probably the ones we're least aware of about ourselves because we don't stand in front of a mirror and, and observe ourselves when we're having a conversation with someone else or when we're on the phone with someone. And 
we need to seek feedback from others to know, do I have any nonverbal habits, any facial expressions, any body language tendencies that are off-putting, you know, that might be misinterpreted or might be um, offensive even to someone. You need to know these things. So you're also watching for the other person's, noticing the other person's facial expression, body language. If you're talking with someone and they, they get a kind of a confused look on their face, that should be a signal, oh, I'm not being as clear as I should be, you know, or, or open up the door to have them ask you some questions or ask for more information. Um, your body language can matter way more than your words. Studies have proven that. So we need to be mindful or noticing our own body language. Some of it plays into what people interpret as incivility even. Now this cycle can be broken. But it's interesting because incivility and rudeness can cause stress. Stress then causes loss of awareness. And that loss of awareness <laughs> causes potential incivility or rudeness. Incivility is in the eye of the beholder. Now, it could start here, though. You're stressed. You don't have awareness of how you're showing up. You're not noticing. You're not noticing something about the other person. And it ends up being something that they're interpreting as offensive or incivil, incivil or rude. Uh, I love this quote from Christine Porath, who's written a lot on the subject of incivility. She says, most incivility comes not from malice towards others, but from unawareness of one's own tendencies. We're just not aware. So it's important. Um, I worked with someone for a long time who never took her sunglasses off the top of her head the whole time she was at work whether she was in a meeting, whether she was in her office, whether she was teaching a class. And I don't think she ever realized that there was a subtle message that I'm not here for long. You know, I, I'm, I'm just here for, you know, this moment and, and I'm in a hurry to get out the door because I, that's, isn't that why we just flip our sunglasses up on top of our head? Because it's a temporary thing. But I never, I never said anything to her about it, um, but you know what? She did end up making it temporary and going out the door, but I don't, you know, we just don't know those things. So it's important. Well, that's true. That's true. Um, but it is important to just learn, you know, what is it that we're, we're not aware of? What else do we need to notice? We need to notice our own filters, our own way that we see the world is influencing how we show up. That's our age, our gender, our race, our ethnicity, our life experience, whether we're a parent, whether we're, uh, you know, our education level, there's so many things that make up how we see the world. And that can influence how we show up in our communication. And it can show up in the form of an unconscious bias. We all have them. And you think about, you know, Dorothy and Glenda, they had very different perceptual lenses because you know, the pink bubble comes out of the sky, Glenda lands. She says to Dorothy, hey, are you a good witch or a bad witch? And Dorothy says, who me? I'm, I'm just Dorothy Gale from Kansas. Well, is that the witch? She points down to Toto. Well, that's Toto, my dog. No. Well, I'm a little muddled because the munchkins called me and said a wicked witch. You know, you know that story there. And Dorothy says, no, I've already told you. I'm, I'm not a witch because witches are old and ugly dorothy says and the munchkins laugh i know you can hear them <laughs> and glinda says well i am a witch i'm glinda the good witch of the north well they in kansas witches weren't like glinda but in oz they were so we have these unconscious biases they can get in the way they can be a barrier to us really connecting with someone i will tell you this isn't an uh, was an embarrassing thing that happened to me. I was so excited when Washington got an Aldi because I'd heard good things about their, their produce department. And I'm all about saving money too, you know. And at that point I was eating a little healthier. And so that was my mission, go in the door. I'm headed straight to the produce department. Well, in the parking lot, I pull in, a woman pulled in with a minivan and it was about a 40 degree day, kind of cloudy. And this woman got out with three children. None of them had coats on. One had shorts, one had sandals. My unconscious bias as a mom 
she's a bad mom. Where are those kids' coats? Why does that one have shorts on? And sandals, it's 40 degrees outside. Go inside, I head to the produce department. She heads for the fish sticks, the tater tots. My unconscious bias, bad mom. She's feeding her kids crap. Well then, I'm a, I'm a Christian. God tapped me on the head. Maybe it was a, more like a slap on the head. <laughs> Cindy, she might not have the money to buy coats for her kids. She might not know how to cook a meal using fresh produce. No one's ever taught her. So I'm not telling you what I did to brag about myself, but I got up, you know how the checkout line works at Aldi. It's very quick, you know, and I'm thinking, okay, I already made up my mind. I'm buying her groceries if she gets behind me. Well, she did. She was behind me. And of course, you're, you know, you got to get your own stuff. And I'm trying to get out of there. I didn't want her to know. I just felt, you know, God laid it on my heart. I should do that. It was a lesson for me. And uh, I almost made it out the door, but she was insisting that the cashier tell her who bought. And so she, I'm about to go out the door and she's pointing at me. Well, after some tears and hugs and, you know, it was all great, but it was a big lesson for me in the fact that we all have these unconscious biases. The difference is to recognize it in the moment. That's really what's key. Don't, don't give somebody a pretty woman moment. That's, that's a classic example of that. So how can you become more aware? That's really what we want to know. I don't want anybody to go through life delusional, you know, thinking that uh, they're showing up one way when in fact they have some issues. <laughs> so you need to just be honest with yourself, you know, an honest reflection, you know, the person in the mirror. We need to really take a, a serious look. We need to also seek feedback. Remember I said, with, especially with nonverbal behavior, we often just don't know, or we don't know some of our tendencies unless we learn. So it's to gain aware of what I've labeled fatal distractions. They don't literally kill someone, but they can kill your ability to be an effective communicator. They can kill your ability to really connect and build a relationship with someone. And so I want to explain to you what is a fatal distraction. It's an unintended message that's coming across through any aspect of your brand environment. And, and this is your brand environment. You know, it's, it's everything about you. So if you remember Seinfeld and the famous pulp friction episode where George Costanza um, is at the breakfast table and I think it's Jerry across from him eating a grapefruit and the pulp gets shot into George's eye. And so the rest of the day, he's, he's winking. And, he, and it just is so humorous, the, the different interactions. He goes to his boss to talk about something and he's winking at his boss. And, you know, so he's obviously, those were not his intended messages. And this is a humorous way to look at it. But let me tell you my story. This is where I learned, this is really where I started seriously thinking about this whole concept of fatal distraction. So uh, I taught at Robert Morris University, uh, the Peoria campus, and I uh, while I was still at ICC, I taught there a couple of years part-time, but I became a full-time business professor in 2004. So it was the fall of 2004, my first quarter as a, as a business professor. Intro to business class. You know how the first class goes, right, Nairobi? The teacher is explaining you know, what to expect. They're showing you the Blackboard site online. Here's the textbook, yada, yada. And of course, I, and I do student introductions around the room. And... I got to the point where it was time for questions. And this woman in the back row, her hand shot up immediately. And I'd learned in introductions that it was her first college class, she was 30. And I remember at the moment thinking, oh, that's how old I was when I started college. I was 30, huh? yeah. kind of filed that away. Anyway, I said, yes, what's your question? She said, do you give pop quizzes? Some of you might've heard this story before. And I thought, oh, that was not a question I was ever expecting. How do I answer that? I never gave a pop quiz as a part-time teacher, but hey, I'm a full-time business professor now. I might want to give a pop quiz every now and again. Well, I couldn't tell her yes and then not give one or the opposite. Either way, I would have been dishonest. And honesty is a very, very, very uh, important value to me. So I said something like this. Well, I'm not in the habit of giving pop quizzes. I think there's a better way I can assess your learning. 
and a better way that we can spend our time together. I said, but I'm curious, why did you ask that question? And she said in this exact tone of voice back to me, because you seem sneaky. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I don't have a poker face. I'm sure that I was like, I couldn't wait to go to the ladies room after class, look in the mirror. You know, what was it about me that caused her to perceive me as sneaky? Here is the biggest mistake I made. I passed it off as her problem. Oh, she's 31st college class. She's just nervous. Oh, I probably remind her of somebody who gave a pop quiz to her in the past and it had a bad outcome. It's her problem, not mine. Fast forward into the quarter. I noticed students weren't really coming to me during <laughs> office hours. They weren't really seeking me out. And I went to a colleague of mine. I said, Joe, I'm fun. I'm approachable. He said, can we talk? <laughs> I said, yes, because I can't help my students be successful if they're not trusting me and engaging with me. So he said, well, let's start with how you're dressed. I had on a black business suit that day, more black than, you know, I had a shirt that was mostly black too. He says, you just kind of look like a barrier. Well, that's an easy fix. This is a little bit of the softer side of Cindy. I can change up with a little color, but I, I still wear quite a bit of black, I like black, but that's an easy fix. And then he said, what do students usually say when they show up in your doorway to your office? And I said, I think most of them say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm interrupting you. He said, yeah, cause it's written all over your face. He said, you're an introvert, aren't you? I said, yes, Myers-Briggs assessment, I'm an introvert, believe it or not. Introverts like their quiet, alone, focused thinking time. He said, you're, you're focused on you know, working on the next assignment for your students or whatever, research for something. And he says, you just need to be in the moment before you even turn towards your door, put down what you're doing, put a smile on your face, soften your facial expression, open your body language, Hi, Nairobi, great to see you. What can I help you with today? Again, an easier fix. The hardest thing for me was what he said last. He said, did it ever occur to you your students find you intimidating? No, wow. He said, you're smart. You're able to talk about a lot of subjects easily. And these are freshmen, you know. He said, do you say things in the classroom like, does anyone have a question? Does that make sense? I said, yeah, aren't those things teachers are supposed to say? He said, nobody's gonna know. I don't get it <laughs> if they feel intimidated by you. They need to see more than your competence, Cindy. They need to trust you. Mm -hmm. And so I worked more on letting them see that side of me, mm -hmm. that I am caring, I am compassionate. I am there for them. And proving that was more important than you know, proving that I had the intellect, I, that I'm proud of my intellect. Let me say that. I'm not going to give up the fact that I am an intellectual. I love that. But I have to know that about myself and know how can I change things up in, in all the ways. You, you, we touched on many things here, uh, the way I said things or the, what I said, my body language, my appearance, and so forth. Um, this, these are all the areas you have a chance to be mindful of how you're showing up based on what you've learned about your personal tendencies and how people tend to respond to you as well. That's the other key. So the last attribute though, is how thoughtful are you? Thoughtfulness is what we're talking about here. Are you taking others into consideration as you're showing up in all parts of your life? Well, there are two ways to look at the meaning of the word thoughtful. Uh, one, you're a thinker. That's a good thing to be. But secondly, is that you are considerate of others. So combine the two, and it means that you're thinking about others' well-being. You're thinking about your impact on other people in the way that you're showing up and you're communicating. So what should you be more thoughtful about when you are communicating, what, giving more insightful thought to? One is your voice. How is your voice influencing? And I really wanna focus mainly on uh, two areas here. Everything you see on this side, enunciation, pronunciation, and rate. So it's how clearly you speak, how slow, 
Bueller, <laughs> or how fast you speak. You know, when you're talking too fast, people can understand you and follow along. So that's about clarity. Showing respect for your listener is doing your best to be as clear as you can through your vocal qualities. The other things that really matter, probably more than any of these things, tone and inflection, they go hand in hand. So inflection is merely where do you put the emphasis on a syllable or a word in a phrase? Because I could say, great job, Kim. Or I could say, great job, Kim. <laughs> The words are the same, right? But the meaning comes out completely different. That's really interesting to notice. So one of the things to know about tone, most important thing in my opinion, people use your tone of voice to interpret how they think you feel about them. That's why tone is so important. And inflection is just the, the mechanism we use to convey tone. What else should you be more thoughtful about is being clear and concise. So um, this statement is listed in your handout on the middle of page three. Uh, how could we rephrase it so we're more clear and concise? It is my determination that Sally is demonstrating indications of increased positive socialization with various managers and coworkers. <sighs> what the heck does that even mean? <laughs> You know, we can simplify that. <laughs> Sally is getting along better with others. Wow, we don't have to use these grandiose flowery words. We, we can cut out a lot of extra words if we work hard. The thing is, if you look, and this is probably, there's probably even more than since I put this slide together, 800,000 words in the English language. I'm sure that's even more because they're constantly adding words to the dictionary. Um, we only use about 800 on a regular basis. Those 800 have 14,000 meanings. No wonder. Just think about the word fix. It has nine different meanings. And it really, it became an issue if you remember, um, oh, I can't remember the name of the airlines, but there was a crash in the Florida Everglades back in the 90s. And it was because somebody had, had um, said these fuel tanks uh, are fixed and they weren't empty. They had misinterpreted the, the word, yeah, exactly. So uh, 17 meanings for each word. So, you know, what do we do? We, our word choice matters. We have a lot to choose from. So it's being tactful, being diplomatic, it's putting some thought into what are the words that we should be using. Um, I wanna share with you something literally I just read in the Bible this morning. God is good. He, he put this in front of me this morning. This was in um, the Apostle Paul's letter to the uh, Colossians. Chapter four, let your conversation be always full of grace. Mm -hmm. So it's not simply the presence of words, it's the quality of the words that we choose. So word choice is something we should be thoughtful about. I mean, even something as simple as saying, I'll talk to you later. Does that mean in five minutes, in a few hours? Does it mean tomorrow? Does it mean five days from now? Does it mean I never want to talk to you again? <laughs> so leaving things open for interpretation, we can help that if we choose our words a little more carefully. Um, word choice also plays into our phrasing, how all the fillers that we use. You certainly don't want to hear the surgeon say this. <laughs> That just clutters up our language and it can cause confusion. It can cause distrust. It can cause a lot of, of misinterpretation. We can also speak in a more positive way. We can phrase things. And I'm, I'm just gonna highlight this last one. You have all of these in your handout, but I wanna highlight the last one because that's, that's personal experience. So when I was at ICC, um, my last 10 years there, I was the coordinator of student activities. And at every college campus, the student activities department is responsible for posting flyers, whether they're our own events, uh, college events, or people from outside the community. And people would show up with stacks of flyers and wanna put them you know, all over. And, and before you know it, you have no room for your own events and things. And so 
I developed a posting policy of all things. You know, we had to have a posting policy. Um, and I said, let's designate 10 bulletin boards just for community events. So people will know that's where to look. And then we'll put them around campus so they're in high traffic locations. Well, I was in, in my office and I heard my staff member say to someone who had walked in with a stack of 50, you know, and said, I wanna post these around campus or can you post these? And she said it just like this, we can only post 10 copies of your flyer. Now, what do you imagine that person's response was? What do you mean? Yeah, you're limiting. What do you mean you can only post 10 copies? You guys got bowling boards all over the place. So it was just a matter of coaching her. How can you turn that into a positive phrasing versus the way that she had said it? And so you see what we came up with as I coached her to say, we have 10 locations around campus with bulletin boards dedicated to nothing but community events. So they stand out from the others and we'll get those up for you right away. That's very, very simple, but we often don't pause. So we should also be mindful of the method for our communication. Is it appropriate for a text? Is it better to send an email? Is it better to pick up the phone? Is it better to go talk to the person face to face? I have a friend who uh, called me about a month ago. She was distraught because she had, she had interpreted this person's email response in a way that, that um, said she was incompetent in a roundabout way. That was her interpretation. And they were kind of going back and forth and back and forth on, on something that she was requesting and how she was requesting it. And she just kept feeling deflated, deflated, deflated. And I said, did you think about calling to clarify what it is you're needing and get, you know, so that you can find out more of, uh, from his perspective? No, I sent another email. <laughs> I said, how about walking down to his office and talking in person? You know, so we just have to use our good judgment. That's what a lot of this is. So how can you be more thoughtful? Pause. We have the, the beauty of a space that we can call up. We can gain space with a pause. What do we gain? We gain the ability to unhook if we need. You know, I think Will Smith could have used this. Sorry, I brought yeah. the slap heard around the world. You know, it just that pause to stop in the moment. We can gain the ability to notice better what's going on, how we're showing up, what's the other person, uh, and exercise our own good judgment and thinking and reasoning if we take time to pause. Um, the other way to be more responsive and, and, or excuse me, be more thoughtful is to be responsive and respectful. What happens when you don't get a response from someone? Your mind is just playing all kinds of, of other scenarios in, in your, oh, they don't like me. Oh, I said something wrong. Oh, you know, and so what happens is then that person that's not responding has inadvertently caused you to have to follow up. It's not a bad thing. We're all busy. That's what we need to just respect that we're all busy. Um, but know that when you don't respond, that also sends a message that's just wide open for interpretation. So we wanna make sure, uh, sorry about that. I didn't mean to put my laser on. Let me turn that back off. If I can figure out how to do it, sorry. It's the cat, yeah, the cat did it. <laughs> Demonstrating courtesy and integrity, of course, is another way to be very thoughtful. Um, common courtesy, please, thank you. All those things that we were taught a long time ago go a long way. But what about integrity? Here's what I want to share with you about integrity. Um, it's consistency between your words and your actions. It's honoring your commitments, like the wizard did not. And he was confronted by Dorothy. But it's also demonstrating any values you say you hold true. Like you heard me say earlier, honesty is a value that's very, very important to me. So if I, if you found out that I lied to you about something, <laughs> my integrity is gone. It takes years to build up your reputation, but only a few seconds to destroy it. So um, that's another way to be thoughtful. Uh, we've covered a lot of ground today, and I want to leave you with one of my favorite quotes from Michael Josephson, who is an ethicist. 
So ethics and moral courage are something I pray um, that we have more of in our world every day. I love, this is only an extract actually from a really, really long statement of his, but it's my favorite part. At the end of life, what really matters is not what we built or what we got, but what we shared. Not our competence, but our character. Not our success, but our significance. And honestly, I believe in my heart that these three key attributes, presence, awareness, and thoughtfulness, can all help you to have greater significance in the most positive way in your life. And I appreciate Kim's invitation to speak with you today. I appreciate so much being here with all of you. Thank you for your interaction with the peeps and everything else that you assisted with today. Um, is there anything you expected to learn about mindful communication that I didn't touch on or anything that I did share that you'd like to know a little more about? We have a few, just a couple minutes to do that. Jeannie?